boom it is an episode of the grail with my guest introduce yourself my man uh hi my name is perry shall uh from philadelphia i'm an artist musician whatever t-shirt collector mostly i guess hell yes you are and a friend of mine how are you buddy uh <laughs> look at that are you at your house where are you today this is my uh my studio where i do all my work and art you know art stuff mostly and play a little guitar and kind of just my uh my space to do whatever do you got a, a fan on or something there no does it sound like there's a yeah weird somebody else said that recently and i'm like no fans, no heater. <laughs> Let me see what. It, oh, you know what it is? I, it, it is. It is technically a fan. My laptop has. It's. It plugs into a. Uh, let's see. This should stop it. There we go. Boom. I forget. The only fan I have is cooling off my computer, which is the thing I'm talking into. So of course, <laughs> everybody's always like, "What is that noise?" And I. I must be on your end. No, it's uh, uh, well. Now I solved that for the other zooms. That's perfect. Thank you. Great shirt you're wearing <laughs> today. Bill Graham and K Sam presents Graham, Graham Parker. Wow, look at that. That is rad, dude. Look, that's a good condition, man. Dude, him on the shirt, wearing the shirt. You know, like I, I love that idea of putting the person on the shirt, inside the shirt, inside the shirt, whatever. Well, that's the old uh, never wear your own shirt or don't wear the band <laughs> shirt to the venue. I was like, hey, who the fuck makes these rules? Get out of here. You know what I mean? Totally. Or, or, you know, I used to be so concerned with wearing your own band shirt. And then if you look at any old picture of Metallica, oh. or a bunch of bands, but Metallica, I remember seeing a picture of one of the members of Metallica wearing their own shirt. And I was just like, Man, nobody looks cooler than these guys did, so I think it's okay. <laughs> well, I think they got it from Steve Harris. I, I personally believe, you know, Steve right, Harris wore right. every shirt. So I personally believe that maybe, you know, early on in the day, he might have pulled him aside and said, hey, there's no better way to sell shirts than letting the kids see you wear it. Like, hey, this thing's cool enough for me to wear, you know? And totally. who, did, who didn't want to wear the stuff their rock star friends wore? Well, and, and aren't you so particular? I mean, you've been in bands. When you get a shirt made, you're like, you want to make it something that you would wear. Oh, yeah. And then most, most people don't actually do it. They don't wear it. So it's like, well, why did you give, you know, why, as somebody who designs T-shirts, well, you know, I get the idea, but wear it. Why not? It's awesome, right? You paid for it. <laughs> well, that was the complete idea of when you, when you came up with the design for my new shirt, I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to wear this. Uh, it's, it's like an old cool parking lot bootleg Dean Del Rey shirt. And I'm going to wear this. I, I love it, man. Let's, let's Thank get you. into, uh, a little bit of your history. Now we first met, I guess, through Instagram or something, but you're a massive t-shirt collector. Um, I've had, some of the biggest on I've had Patrick at Wyco. I've had mm -hmm. Blaine Haverson and now you. And it's funny because other than Patrick, uh, Blaine and you are also full blown artists in the business. So let's get into your history a little bit. First of all, how old are you? Uh, this year? Um, let me think what year is I'm 30. <laughs> I'm 35 as of today's date. Yes. 35 man now how do you get into all this because i'm 55 that's standard i grew up in it but what got you into it was it your parents were rockers or what what's going on uh, th they weren't so much rockers as you know music fans and my my family my grandmothers both of them were were artists and so I think it was always just ingrained in me. My grandfather played music. My mom's uncle played music. Like it was just kind of around, but not really in the way that you and I are involved with this stuff. You know, they were just, it was like a thing that they did. And my grandmothers were really good at art and um, it, it was hanging on the walls and all that stuff. And so I think it was all just in my subconscious. 
uh, subconscious and like, how do I say that word? Subconscious? Sub anyway, I'm not a linguist. I'm an artist. Uh, <laughs> so the shirt, the shirt thing really came about was like, I always gravitated towards old stuff. I'd find my parents old stuff from their childhoods. Um, you know, my mom had, or my, one of my parents had this thing that was just like cloth on a dowel that they made when they were kids and they had all their buttons all over it. Old buttons from Philly old peace sign, hippie buttons, all this cool stuff. And I was so attracted to it. And I'd be like, Hey mom and dad, can I, can I hang this in my room? And then it starts with the Beatles records and, you know, Zeppelin records and Nilsson and all this other stuff. And it wasn't like they were pushy. It was just around. And for whatever reason, I gravitated towards it all. And the t-shirt thing was, I was, maybe 12 years old the the entrance to the attic in our house was through my closet in my bedroom and i never cared i didn't want to go in there and whatever reason one day i was like i wonder i'm bored i wonder what's in the attic and i just started digging i probably made a huge mess and i'm just like what's in here there's got to be some cool stuff my dad saves my dad had his shoes from his bar mitzvah wow like he wasn't a hoarder by any means but he kept these very specific things. And I don't know if he knew why besides he felt like he couldn't let go of it, but the attic didn't have that much stuff in it, but I it had this trash bag and I I'm going towards this trash bag. I go, wonder what's in here. I open it up and I pull out this Bruce Springsteen, 85 born in the USA tour shirt. Wow. Raglan, spectrum. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm assuming, or JFK maybe it was probably the spectrum at that point. So right. um, it had all the tour dates on the back. So I don't remember which was the Philly one, but you know, black sleeve raglan gray, Heather gray. I mean, it's classic and it, it looked this like, it was one, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it was, it was the, the shirt and I pulled it out and I was like, wow, this shirt is so cool. And I was, when I was 12, you know, I don't remember what year, 90, mid, mid 90, some point. It wasn't cool to like Bruce Springsteen at my age. Yeah. So, it's hip hop. Like hip hop you know, is like hitting NWA. And I was know. really into, I was really into all that stuff too, but I liked my parents stuff. I was the, I was the guy who wanted to hear what tapes my parents were playing and you know, they liked what I played too a lot of the times. So I pulled this Bruce Springsteen shirt. All I wanted at that time was to have a band shirt that my, all my friends had them, but they're like 20 bucks. Right. My parents weren't going to spend 20 bucks on a shirt like that. So I start pulling these out. I thought I found a loophole. These are cool. These are old. Nobody else has these at my age. Nobody else cares about Bruce Springsteen and I like them. So I'll start wearing it. What's all, what else is in here? So there's like Billy Joel, you know, early, uh, I mean, not early, like a, a early eighties, maybe mid eighties, Billy Joel. I start finding local restaurants that we go to, like my, we were still going to when I was a kid right. that my parents grew up going to. There's like a car parts place that my uncle still owns. I got that shirt now. Like, well, at that point, tw I still have it, but now were, years these, old. were these your dad's shirts? Did he go to these shows? Yeah, Harry Chapin, autographed Harry Chapin shirt. Like these were all his, his, just his shirts that maybe he didn't fit or didn't wear anymore. And so I thought I hit the jackpot. I start pulling all these shirts out. I have a whole new wardrobe. I show up to school. Oh, my mom's uncle, who was a musician who I told you about, he played accordion. He had a band here that his name was uh, Eddie Silk, which is the greatest name. And he yeah. had a shirt, Eddie Silk Band. and. Wow. They played my parents' wedding. So now I have these shirts of my uncle's band. I mean, how mind blowing was that to me? So I started wearing them to school and my friend tells me my brother got a pair of Doc's, Doc Martens at the thrift store for three bucks. Wow. And I came home that day. I said, dad, we, we need to go to a thrift store. And he was like, really? And we were already doing flea markets and stuff like that. But a kid my age doesn't want used clothes. You get made fun of. But I thought, no, this is how I step out and, and be different from everybody else. Cause I still liked a lot of the stuff everybody liked. In fact, I liked all the stuff all my friends liked, but I didn't want to, I wasn't 
I didn't feel cool enough to be the skater kid, even though I skateboarded since I was like six. I wasn't good at it, but I did it. But those kids were, they had their thing. They were cool, you know? Right. Tur turns out they're not that cool. You know, no. they're not that unique. They're not that original. They don't have great taste. That all cookie the time. cutter. Cookie cutter. Yeah. And so as a kid, I was trying to fit in until I realized like, well, why would I fit in? I'd rather just be the weird one because I felt like that. Now, and I at, still do. At this time, were you also drawing stuff like album covers, you know, mimicking, say, Sergeant Peppers? Were you digging into because I had friends I knew right away they were going to be artists because they were doing album cover they were doing acdc logo they would do the van halen logo oh, perfect i couldn't draw a straight line and then they got into doing band logos for my band and local bands and doing flyers and all that how do you start to get into doing some art yeah i mean that is it, it, it's the typical thing i've been drawing as long as i can remember you know that's what all artists say but i was and looking back on it people start to tell me like, oh yeah, I always knew that you were gonna do art. And I just thought, really? That's just what I did. Now I find out I have, now I have ADHD. So when I look back on it, I'm, I, I kind of feel validated because all my notebooks were drawings. I would literally scribble fake words in the notebook so it looked like I was taking notes. It was just this all over the page, just wavy lines and the rest of it would be okay, how good can I draw uh, Fred Flintstone? Yeah. And I would practice the Flintstones and the Jetsons and Felix the Cat and Garfield oh. and all this stuff because that's what I was obsessed with. And, and you know, it changed. Eventually I was trying to draw Sonic the Hedgehog or something, whatever. Right. right. But it was always, uh, if I could draw Mickey Mouse and make it look like Mickey Mouse, then I'm doing something right. Do you do you remember when they changed Barney's voice? I was t I tweeted about it uh, <laughs> about a month ago, but I was like, how come no one's talking about it still that they changed Barney's voice and didn't let it, didn't tell us why? Do you remember that? Um, I, I remember looking. I didn't as a kid. I didn't notice it, of course. Um, oh, I did. As an adult, when I watched, because I I still watch that stuff, and um, now it's pretty obvious. You're yeah. like, what? They tried to pull this off like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like there's these shows where they just have all of a sudden a different person. That's the same character. They even did it. I think it was like bewitched or whatever. Yeah. Like different. Darren. Yeah. Two Darren's. Yeah. yeah. Two Darren's. That's a good band name. Two Darren's. <laughs> that is a great band name. Yeah. They're like, there's no Darren's in your band. Yeah. This is some <laughs> bewitched shit before your time, dude. <laughs> that's some hipster yeah, but, stuff. So, so, so like we had Nick at night when I was a kid. Um, yeah. And so that's how I got into all that. It's like, I felt it, I, I was so attracted to the older stuff because the newer stuff is, it just didn't feel natural to me for some reason. And I liked a lot of it, but I, I wasn't excited about cartoon new cartoons until Beavis and Butthead, MTV oddities, MTV wow. liquid television. Right. That was the stuff that sucked me in. Like I remember watching the first episode of Beavis and Butthead when it aired the first time on TV by accident. Cause I was just, that was just always what I watched late at night. And it, it made me feel like it was the Flintstones of my generation for yeah. lack of a better comparison. But so, yeah, I just always grew up drawing, trying to get better and better. And yeah, like you said, you draw a band logos, you know, you, you start drawing the band members that you like and I just always did that. The Beastie Boys, the Beatles. Um, eventually, I was drawing Alanis Morissette in the 90s. And yeah, I get it. All this stuff, whatever I liked, I had to draw it. And at what point do you start? Uh, I don't know what instrument you play, but at what point do you also start playing music? Well, I don't know what it, I still don't know what instrument I play. I, I started in, a, in fourth grade this kid came to our class and said, Hey, we need somebody to play drums in, uh, you'll get out of class once a week or whatever it is. I, 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 without thinking twice, I go, Oh, I like Ringo. I'll, yeah, I'll do it. And I, and I ran out of the, I grabbed my stuff and we went downstairs and I started taking drum lessons and I did that for years, uh, eventually on and off. And then in high school, somebody said, 
this song is really easy. To, they're playing a song. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you play guitar. And they're like, yeah, I don't really. I just know how to play a couple songs. And I was like, oh, can you show me? And it was like uh, Blister in the Sun by Violent Femmes. And I was like, wow, I kind of played a thing that kind of sounds like that. And I went from drums in marching band to slowly like they wanted me to play guitar. I played electric bass in marching band in senior year of high school, which somebody followed me with a cart and a giant PV amp. Like it was so weird, <laughs> but that's what, that's what the teacher wanted. So yeah, in high school, I started playing guitar. My friend and I, or my two friends and I started a band and it was a mess, but it was an excuse to, again, to do artwork and, and to play guitar it was fun. That's amazing, man. Now, You've uh, you've created some uh, really incredible uh, album covers and stuff. So obviously you take art serious and start to just do it. But art is kind of one of those weird things where it just seems to happen one day that you maybe got to check. There's not like anywhere where you go apply. Like, I mean, there's graphic artists and all that stuff, but everyone I ever knew one of my favorite humans on the planet, Kevin Christie, they just painting and drawing and then people reach out. So how does this uh, start to happen for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's kind of a typical story, but I had my band and we started playing shows with other bands and they said, I like your T-shirt or I like your your demo art, whatever we barely had, flyers, stuff like that. Can you draw something for us? I was like, uh, yeah, that would be awesome. You know, I, I I draw something, somebody else likes it. Cool. Before it was just kind of for me and my band members needed artwork for our band. So it was just an obvious thing I would do. So when people started asking me, it, it started in high school. And then, you know, I graduated. I started going to like community college. I dropped out. I tried to go to a horrible art school here. I dropped out. I was working construction full time and I was on the construction site and I'm drawing on the drywall. Yeah. I'm drawing on the, <laughs> on the scrap sheet metal. I'm drawing everything always yeah. all the time. And I was in art school briefly. So it made me realize like, not to sound cocky cause I, I, I don't, whatever, but I saw all the other art that a lot of the other people were doing. And it would be like, say we had a class of 20. I, I, I'm not kidding. Like three of us had were making stuff to me that was worth looking at. And that was graphic design because they didn't have an illustration program. So I start doing t-shirts for bands or their CD at the time or seven inches or LP art eventually t-shirts. And uh, I start realizing like I have to charge money. It wasn't very much, but I... I I thought, well, I love doing this. I don't care how much money I make. This is just for fun. I'm, I work full-time construction. I get paid well. I work hard. Um, and then eventually I started realizing, oh, I think I might be good at this. <laughs> you know, 20-something years, you know, early 20s. And so people start paying me and hiring me. And once I start doing a drawing, they say, oh, we want this to be our artwork for the album. And then I have to figure out, well, how does text work? All right. How does, how do logos work? How do, how do you, where do you put it? I have the drawing. Where do I put the rest of it? And so I just started figuring it out. And eventually people are like, oh, so you do like graphic design. I was like, no, I draw. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but you're designing this album. You did the front and the back and the insert and the, the layout. Yeah. Or the, or the labels on the record and all this stuff. And I go, oh yeah. I guess so. And then I started realizing you can do more than one thing. You don't have to be one thing. And a lot of people do one thing, but I get so many more jobs, I think, because I have the ability to adapt because that's what I had to do because eventually I had to make a living off of it because I was doing it so much. Right, right. So I just started to try to adapt and I'm still adapting. I'll always be adapting, but that's the fun of it for me. You never, there's no answer. There's no hard, it's not math. It's always changing and people's opinions always are changing. And for me, it's about getting the person I'm working for 
to love what I did, but for me to also know that it's worth a damn to look at. Do you remember the big band, the first big band artwork that you did? Jeez. So the, I used to tour with bands doing um, like roadie merch, TM, whatever they needed. And my friends are in a band called Screaming Females, who right. I don't know if you've ever heard of them or not, but uh, Marissa, uh, Marissa Paternoster is the singer guitar player. I met the band because my band was on tour. We played with them randomly in like South Carolina somewhere and in, in like literally an abandoned house that was missing part of the floor. That was just the owner just said, do what you want. Pay me rent at the end of the month. Nobody lived there. It was just for shows. And we meet this band from New Jersey and I hit it off. And so they take me on tour and they're touring with other bands. And I tell these other bands, hey, I do artwork, whatever. You know, that's what I get to know each other. I do art and I do like maybe some T-shirts for screaming females or whatever. I meet this other band called Jeff the Brotherhood that they were on tour with. They take me on tour and I start doing art for them and they got signed to a major. So then I start to get paid a little bit like way more reasonable amount of money for my time. Wow. And I start to realize, oh, they're opening. You know, we went on tour with the kills. We went on tour with. Yeah, you did an interview with Allison, right? Two of them. Yeah, I love her. She's a good friend of mine. Great yeah, artist, she's, too. She's a painter. She's a she's, singer, songwriter. Uh, amazing. She's super talented and she was super cool to hang out with her. And, um, but so they started doing these tours with these bigger bands. And I started to think like, I'm not a pushy person. I just mention what I do. I put it out there. I love to help people with the artwork because the last thing I want is to see a band I care about have shitty artwork, you know? It's so, it's such a bummer. And it's really, uh amazing when i see somebody that gets it say you or blaine haverson when i see somebody that gets it like when i saw blaine and went to his shop it was like and i've described it before it was like the blind melon video i'm the bumblebee and i found another bumblebee out there like oh my god God, this guy's obsession and this guy's eye for detail and this guy's knowledge of rock concert T-shirts and art and logos and also the the uh, obsession of the inks and the, the cottons and the 50-50s and the logos and labels on the uh, shirts. Everything was like, I, here I'm thinking I'm the only guy that's a nut job like this growing love, up, you know, uh, you know what I mean? And I still totally. feel that first kiss dynasty shirt, uh, that I ever bought. And then the next one being the back and black one. And those are two shirts that I own multiples of because they're so deep to me. And the third would be the appetite for destruction tour robert williams uh, oh my god so those are the three shirts that are yeah there you go look at that that's the old great parking lot bootleg there because it's just a mixture of eras and stuff where the people don't know you know look i could that. go in yeah totally i got that from the guy who who got it at the show you know wow but no i i, I agree with you and when i listened to that interview you did with him it gave me the chills. I was like, oh, my God. It, same thing you said. Somebody who you thought you're the we know that we're not the only ones. But how far do we have to go to find some one other person like this? So it's amazing. You introduced me to his work and it blew my mind. And it was like, this is the guy who's doing what I've always wanted to do. And I feel at peace with it, knowing that somebody's doing it right. 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 You know, it'd be great. Have you ever met him? No, I would love to talk. I would, I would love to punish that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sent him, I sent him over the new t-shirt design and he was like, this is fantastic. So oh. a collab between the two of you would be amazing. Uh, it would be amazing. But back to what you're saying, uh, bands with bad art, it's, it's a bummer because when you're a young kid and you're rolling through a record store, you a lot of times don't even know what the band sounds like 
you look at the cover and many people that I've talked to, Scotty and many people on the show, they're like, I didn't even know what it was. I just saw Iron Maiden and I was like, killers, what's this? You know, ah, I'm buying this. And the artwork crushed it for them. Got it, got that record in a kid's hands and got it home and man and then if the music's good it's a double whammy you feel like you hit yeah you feel like you became all of a sudden like rich or something you're like i thought that i was getting this thing that i just i just hoped for the best i didn't know what to expect it looked cool and i assumed it would be but sometimes it is not nearly as good as it looks but when it is you're like everybody here did their job and did did it right and that artist perfectly was able to express what this music sounds like and the first thing you if you don't know anything about an artist your first experience with these people who are making music for a living is not the music it's the art exactly when you go into a record store you're surrounded by art before you're surrounded by actual music besides Absolutely. what they're Absolutely. playing over the air. Yeah. You know. and, and all the stuff in there, uh, perfect example is that Y co vintage on Sunday, uh, good friend. And he's got all the, the classic record store promotional cardboards, the cutouts, the I, spinnies, all that. I got Teddy Pendergrass back here. Yes. I got an Elvis Costello, Two Elvis Costello standees from from you know promo from record stores. Yeah, um, that's the stuff I I still like to surround myself with because going being a kid going into Tower Records for me or on South Street in Philly I used to go to all the record stores there. You walk in and you just feel at home. You know you feel like this is the stuff I want to. I could stare at this for days straight. Oh, I loved it. I love, I, and I still love them. You know, when I see, oh, yeah. like, uh, I was there Sunday and he had the cheap trick dream police cardboard cutouts of all of them. I'm just looking at oh that. Like, God. I mean, the vision, uh, it was just so, it was so massive back then, the seventies and eighties, you know, starting with stuff like Boston with their album covers. Oh my God. Right. It's just like, look at this. I just, I just told people that the spaceship is a guitar. Most people uh, didn't even realize it. Oh man. And, I knew and it like, right away. I was like, look at that. It either hits you or it's just a spaceship and whatever. But for me, the album cover and, and that record, oh my God, that first record, you know, you look at that thing and you just go, I don't know what I want everything. I'm all in whatever it is. I'm all in. Yeah. Yeah. And also those concerts that I've talked about over and over and over, people are like, oh my God, here he goes talking about Dan the Green again. <laughs> if you went to one Dan the Green, you would be talking about it for the rest of your life. I went to multi, multiple Dan the Greens, but Dennis Larkin creating all of those scrims for the stages and, and the stuff he did for the dead and, you know, I mean, when you pulled up to the war field and he had the skeletons out there or at Radio City Music Hall, you're looking at this guy's work. He's going to do the podcast here pretty soon. He just doesn't know how to do Zoom yet. But <laughs> these are guys that were creating massive rock and roll fantasy concerts, too. I'm talking backdrops, uh, Hotel California. When you look Dude, at Roger Dean, Roger Dean was like above and beyond. All. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy, man, what these guys created. And uh, it's so kind of cheap now with digital screens. You know, like you come in, you're like, whoa, look at their backdrop. It's a big old digital you know, yeah. screen. But back then, these guys painted these things, you know, um, it was a guy, he just passed away recently, rest in peace, uh, Kevy Metal. He painted a massive backdrop uh, for our band, and it was just fucking cool. You, your band looked pro when you rolled in, and you saw a band with a backdrop, you're like, oh, these guys are going to be good, just from the backdrop. Dude, my, my old band, I remember I, I, when I worked construction, I would take stuff off the job that was trash, you know? So we worked at a place that had a giant, it was a, a classroom, basically, like a whatever those giant college rooms are that with the, with the auditorium seating. I, 
This yeah. is how 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 hard I dropped out of college. I couldn't even tell you the name of a room in the college. Auditorium. But it, had, <laughs> and, uh, but it wasn't even an auditorium. Those lecture lecture halls or whatever. Anyway, they had this giant projector screen, and I just saw canvas, you know. And I was just like, I'm taking this home. It was gonna get thrown out. Yeah. I took home this giant canvas and I I put it on the basement floor and I painted our band a giant banner. Meanwhile, we're playing basement shows, you know. But I'm like, if we show up to the basement and we hang up a banner, people are going to be like, what the hell is going on? We play for 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. And walk well, off. Well, but it's, yeah. we left like, them with that impression. <laughs> well, look at Metallica. They had the ride, the ride, the lightning one. But then they upped the, the game with Master of Puppets. And recently when they played uh, Corbin or one of those shows, I forget, uh, uh, last week they played for the anniversary of master of puppets, they broke out the original backdrop for it. Wow. And, and you can watch it on YouTube and they're just rocking with the original backdrop. And all I'm seeing in my mind was, Oh, when they opened for Ozzy, they had that fucking thing up there and it's just got the, you know, the, the crosses and, and the way that people can make it with the depth. So it looks like it's going down, you know, Crazy. Back, like a row, you know, the totally. 3d effect. All well, of that and, stuff is incredible. And and when they did Injustice and they and they had the inflatable, I mean giant Doris, uh, the whole stage, yeah, Doris and then there was there was I think there was something else, but it was it's just amazing to see that because it takes everything 20 times further than it it, it would have already been and come on, you see Metallica, they don't need anything to put on the most amazing show, but they they bring it every time. Well, that lets you know it's uh, it's psychological too and i i think deep management uh them having the best management in the world q prime other than peter grant i don't think anybody has ever been a manager uh management team better than uh q prime but i, I work with them too and yeah, <laughs> they're great yeah, they're amazing yeah. but you know they're in these rooms and they're like okay so lightning you had a, a backdrop pretty cool uh masters you had a backdrop a high riser and you know more marshall stacks for justice we're gonna go this big doors a backdrop and some bombs and stuff like that for one and what that does to the fans subliminally is let them know oh my guys are getting bigger now they might not even be bigger but you know, visually and, every, and and everything, you start going like, man, these these guys, they they're getting places, man, and that really, and also makes the band feel good. They're like, oh, Shit, I bet. we we got a show here. I mean, imagine Maiden. They're going from a small club to the show I saw two years ago with a full airplane, right? You know, yeah, they're all. taking their own plane there. Wow, you know, it's, it's so so incredible. So yeah, man, uh, the art. Like we say, good art is uh, a must, a must to get into. Now, tell people how you do this art, because we were talking. You don't just, you know, you're not just all digital now and you're not all analog. Give them the rundown on how you create a shirt or an album cover. Yes. Yeah, so I, I mean, because I'm a collector, because I grew up going to thrift stores and, and flea markets and all that, I was always just attracted to the old stuff. And I wanted to know how, how are these people doing it? And the thing is, most of those people, a lot of them went to school, of course, but a lot of them just figured it out or there wasn't technology yet to tell them any different. Um, they didn't have the options. And so I kind of not purposely put myself in the position of no other options, but I know what I know and what I feel like I need to know on the computer and the rest, I, you know, when you record an album and you record to tape, I know most people are like, no, digital sounds better. Well, uh, that's a physical object, that tape. And, and for me, I, I feel like I can only understand things that exist. And to me, it, in person, it has to exist. So when, I, when you hear a band that recorded to tape, that tape existed. And when it's on cassette tape, that is a tape that exists and, and vinyl and stuff like that. 
So with artwork, I want it to go in, I want it to go through my hands. I want to be able to touch it and feel it and manipulate it with my hands because it should be, it should have the feeling of a human being was invested in this thing. Not that a human being is very good at the computer, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. anybody, anybody could watch 500 YouTube videos and be the best Photoshopper of all time. Right. But that doesn't interest me. What interests me is what the hell is this weird shade of purple on this album cover from 1973? And how come it looks like, you know, uh, I love like, you know, Sarone, uh, human nature and all. He was like a weird electronic musician. His album covers are terrifying. They're so weird and disturbing and unique. And I see stuff like that and I just go, that doesn't look like anything else I've ever seen. And it would have been done in Photoshop in five minutes now. Wow. So I want to just, I just love to get into it. And so, heart and soul. You want to put some heart and soul into it. I get it. Dude, when you record a record, you put everything you can into that, into those songs. And all you can think about is, I hope people like this. So when I do art, I want to put everything into it. I want to, and this isn't some, I'm this abstract painter or I do these, whatever it is. If I'm going to do whatever, I want it to be well loved by me before I make somebody else love it. So I have this letter set. I have thousands of rub on letters, you know, from back in the day that you would use from the seventies and the eighties. And then I have, I will print out a photograph if it was taken digitally and rescan it or I'll manipulate the paper. I'll draw on it. I'll, I mean, everything I do has to go through my hands at some point. Nice. And that's just scanning borders, scanning texts. I'll have a book an old textbook of some sort. And I'll go the titles for every chapter are in this different typeface that is not exactly like the version I have on my computer as a font. So I'll go every chapter and I'll scan in as many letters as I can to make up an alphabet and the numbers if I can. And then I pull every letter, every character individually into the artwork because fonts, anybody, my, my, if my great grandfather was alive and never used a computer, I could say type a word. You use the font. That's it. Period. Anybody could do it. You know, yeah. I don't want to do a thing that anybody can do. And so I want everything to feel old and I want it to feel not even old. The words I, I use two words. I don't like retro. I don't think that that is appropriate for what I do. Yeah. And it's, it's not vintage. It's not an old I just made it 2021. So I, I want it all to look timeless and I want it to feel classic and familiar because when you go to a record store and you see that record, I don't want you to think, Oh, in 2003, everybody used this font. That was a free download on this website. Oh, and that's so true. Also people go through these phases. There was like photographers uh, I would say like seven years ago, they were doing these extreme photoshops on a, on a band or a comedian photo where it was like, it looked like some weird painting, you know, it was just so like way too much pop. Now the first couple I saw, I was like, God, that's incredible. But when they were all like that after a while, I was like, Oh, well now everybody's figured out this such and such guy's technique. And now everybody thinks that's what you need to be. What we need to be having is that high contrast, weird painting pop photo. And then everybody had it, you know? Total. Yeah. And, and, and then at what point do you feel, how can you feel, and this isn't a judgment on these people, but how can you feel like an artist when you say, I did this thing that came to me kind of easy on the computer because it, it's a, a button you press or whatever it is. Yeah. And that's cool for them. But I've just always insisted on making stuff that always feels familiar, but fresh, you know, it's funny when you look at stuff where it gets further and further and further into deep technology. And, you know, let, let's talk about anything from like 4k to 6k cameras and, uh, HD and all that. And then somebody just drops an old school Polaroid on you and you just go, wow, look how great that is. I mean, you can, Polaroid. you can feel it. You oh. can feel it. Oh, I'm there. I'm like, well, look at this skate park Polaroid photo 82. And you just, oh man, the Polaroid 
it's so it, a Polaroid truly has soul. It's wild because it was 100%, like 100%. Yeah. People were there, they took it and they instantly had it. And you're like, you know, it's so much cooler than a, a you know, like, hey, I got a cell, I got my cell phone, you know, pictures. It's like, yeah, but look at these, look at these Polaroids. I did a show a couple of weeks ago and they took some Polaroids and I just, I, I'm so glad that format's still around. It, it's so you it's just so unique it doesn't feel like you said you can you you feel the 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 essence of this thing is these chemicals are combining and making this thing and you're like i don't know how it works really i don't either and i've had it my whole life it's been around but to me every time you see something like a polaroid it gives you that feeling and so when i do my album art for people or t-shirts or whatever it is posters um I just want it to feel comfortable, right. comforting and comforting really more than anything. Who are some of the uh, covers that you've uh, been working on recently? I know you were doing some stuff for Dan and everything. Let's talk a little bit about that because your, your career has, uh, you know, you've become a, uh, a, an artist for a living now and you're doing some incredible stuff. People are reaching out to you nonstop. Perfect example of, uh, I always tell people you don't need to live in LA or New York, in this day and age, you just need to do good work and people find you. You're in Philly. So what have you been working on the last few years? So, uh, well, I mentioned earlier that band Jeff, the Brotherhood that I used to tour with, and I was about to leave for a tour. I was in Nashville. That's where they're from. And I was I was there working on their new album art. And the album I was designing was being produced by Dan Auerbach. And at the time I go, oh yeah, Black Keys, okay, I remember them. I mean, I, I like them. In my head, they're like a garage band. You know, I, I thought they were still the band I remembered hearing about when they first started. Right, right. And I, and I thought that was cool. I, you know, their songs were on Eastbound and Down when that show was on. And I was like, wow, this, this, this is perfect Mas for this masterpiece show. Masterpiece show, masterpiece yeah, show. Yeah, oh my God. And and so I would hear their songs and I, I just thought like, oh yeah, this band's pretty good. We listened to one or two of their records or whatever. It, I, I had no idea to what extent they were known at that point. And so they're like, hey, we're going over to listen to the final mixes of the record. Do you want to come with and you can meet Dan and whatever I go, no, I want to work on your artwork. We're about to leave for tour. I want to get this, you know, I want to do it. So they go to the studio I'm sitting here working on the their new album and they come back and they're like, Hey man, um, by the way, I, I understand now so many people would be like, Oh my God, I get to meet Dan. I get to go to the studio, but uh, he's a musician. I'm a musician. I don't care. What do I care about musicians? You know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> if, it, if it's not, if it's not Ringo or something, yeah, Jimmy Page. I, I, is he going to be yeah. in his dragon pants? <laughs> like, give me give me Angus and I'll drop everything. But yeah. I was just kind of like, this guy's cool. I'll meet him one day. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So they come back and they're like, hey, man. Um, so uh, the record sounds great. Whatever. Uh, cool. And um, Dan wants you to, like, do some art for him. Some little things. And I go, yeah, sure. Just give him my, e you know, tell him to contact me. Fine. He writes me and he's like, hey, I want to do this logo for my new studio. Because at the time it was like a pretty new studio he built in Nashville. Yep. And I was like, yeah, you know, um, just PayPal me like 150 bucks or whatever when we're done. And he was like, okay, cool, whatever. So I, I do this logo. He tells me what he wants and I lay it out and hand it off and whatever. That's it. He hits me up another time. Hey, can you do this patch? I just want to make these patches for me and a couple of my friends, whatever. Do one or two of those. He's making a guitar strap. I design that what the what's getting carved into whatever. So this is like maybe 2011 or so. I don't think anything of it. Cool. This guy keeps giving me biz, give me work, and he pays me right away, and it's fun. And then about 2013, I forget what year. I gotta memorize this because this is the this is the one. So this is really the one. Dan's producing this record for this guy, Bombino. Bombino is this incredible guitar player from uh, Niger. And he, the, his music is, it'll, it, again, it will give you the chills when you hear this, the guitar playing. It is unlike anything you've ever heard. He's incredible. And it just made me feel 
good to hear it. And and he said, Dan, Dan contacted me and said, I'm producing this record for Bombino. Do you want to try doing the artwork? I'm like, sure. And he tells me, when we find out how much it'll pay me, and I'm like, oh my God, I think I'm an artist. Yeah. Wow. You know, this is a record label, none such, uh, and Warner, you know, through Warner Brothers. Are you still slinging a hammer at this time, working construction, or is that completely out once you start tour managing and working for bands? Um, I was touring more, and then the company actually went under, and, and, and people started slowly getting laid off, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got laid off. I started working. This is a, a, a pivotal thing, I guess. I started working for these people who sell vintage clothing in Philly. Right. T turns out they're total monsters uh, oh. in the long run and took advantage of me for years. But the Bombino record I was doing while I was working with for them. And they really put me in a weird position where they didn't really make me feel valued ever. And they didn't make me feel like I was very good at art. And they'd have me do art for them, but wouldn't compensate me properly. And I start doing this stuff and I get asked to do this Bombino record and I'm telling them like they thinking they would be proud of me or happy for me. Yeah. And they're they're not. And so he starts the guy, the owner starts talking to me about like, you know, do this thing and this thing. I go, Oh, well, like what if I get more art jobs like this? And he goes, Well, how many do you think you'll really get like that? How many album covers that are gonna pay you that much money do you really think you'll get? You know? Uh, just, just talking down to you because he wants to keep you, he wants to beat you down. He, he had me by your Get rid of your confidence and just, you know, I've got my slave here. Yeah, I get it. Totally. And and what experience did I have? I dropped out of college. Like at that point, I just thought maybe he's right. Maybe I don't have much value in art because why wouldn't I be doing it full time already? Or why wouldn't I have in school? They tried to teach you to to you'll be in a fur. You'll work for an office somewhere being their graphic designer, making brochures like I remember being in college and somebody saying, hey, we got this alumni who graduated from here who's going to come show you what it's like to graduate from this school. This kid's showing us these restaurant menus he made, and I'm looking at them and going, Loser. does anybody see this? <laughs> yeah. Like, this is this is terrible. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't let this show up at, at the, the crappiest restaurant you've ever been to. And so... <laughs> It made me think what I was doing was already better. So fast forward to the working for these people. I do this Bombino artwork for, for this Grammy award winner who produced it. And I go like, I think I need to take a hint. And so I call my friend who I did construction with. We worked for his cousin. He starts his own company. I say, hey, do you need anybody to work? He goes, ah, maybe two or three days a week. And I said, well, what does it pay? And he tells me. And I go, if I work for three days a week for you, I make more than I did in two weeks at the vintage place. Oh my God. I said, I'll see you Monday. Yeah. I, I quit my job and I go, if I have two or three days a week construction, I have more time for art and I'm just gonna bust my ass and work on the art as much as I could. And dude, people would say, there was this band Obits on um, Sub Pop, great band, members of Hot Snakes and all this stuff. They say, hey, we want you to animate a music video for us. Have you ever animated? I said. No, I grew up watching cartoons. I'll animate. I'll figure it out. And dude, I sat home for two weeks. I would work construction three days a week. I'd come home. I'd work till two in the morning, sitting on my bed with a light box that my friend built me. And I would just, I was watching Ken Burns jazz documentary. It was like 12 hours long or so. I was like, I'm just going to zone out. And I drew for two weeks. I handed in the drawings. They made a music video and I go, okay, now I know I can do that. Cause I just said, yes. Yep. And once this starts picking up, I'm doing artwork for a band on Sub Pop. You know, I'm doing I'm doing art for for Bombino. A couple years go by, I'm doing some fun art here and there, doing working for bigger bands and all that. The end of 2016, and I'm sorry this is so long, but it's, it's great though. I love. I, I want to hear the, the story because it's it's cool to hear the progression because people do not ever see the work or hear about the work. It's like me when they come up and they go, how'd you get somewhere so fast? And I tell them, well, I did almost 5,000 spots and I did, you know, open mics every day. And I, and I, I podcast seven days a week and I'm knocking on doors and I'm, I'm hanging out till four in the morning. And then they just go, Oh, 
and they just cruise away. And, you know, when somebody says, how did you get somewhere so fast? I know right away <laughs> they're, they're discounting the work. They're mm-hmm. discounting the work. They hope there's some kind of magic dick you could suck in the back to get, you know, somewhere right away, which is crazy. And, and it's also an insult. It's like, well, you, you know, you, what do you think? I just didn't do the work. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, you know, so I, I love to hear the stories. Yeah. So, I mean, that's exactly right. And, and, and people see, especially some stuff I do is more simplified and people do just think you press a couple of buttons and it's done. And, um, I don't even know how to press those couple of buttons. I take the long way every time, but it, it, for me, it's the, what makes it more satisfying, but what happened, so sorry to wrap it up basically is end of 2016, I hadn't talked to Dan uh, Auerbach in a in couple years, two years maybe at that point, or, or a couple years actually. And his manager emails me, uh, Drew, Drew Q Prime, and he says, uh, can you send me the logo for Dan's studio? Do you have a high res version? And I go, well, why isn't Dan just contacting me for this? He's like, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's busy and we just need the logo, whatever. Um, and, he, and, and he was super cool about it, but I sent it to him and I didn't think much else of it. And then like a couple months go by, I say November of 2016, I get an email from him again. And I was like, oh, what's this about? And he says, hey man, how, how busy are you lately? And I said, well, Why? And he said, Dan is starting a record label and he wants you to do all the artwork for it. Wow. And I every my, record, every record from the beginning, he knew that he wanted me to be doing it. Right. Wow. So I go, uh, what am I doing? I go, well, you happen to catch me at a good time. I happen to be <laughs> wide open right now. Of course <laughs> I was wide open. I was, I was, dude, I was, I was my goal back then. And I'm sure you've been here was at the end of the month after my bills, if I had a hundred bucks in my bank account, I was rich. Yeah, I get that. Right. You know, mid twenties, late twenties, even I mid forties, mid forties. I mean, yeah. And, and mid thirties right now. And, and I thought if I had a hundred bucks in my bank account at the end of the month, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Cause I get to do what I love. Period. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so he asked and I said, yes. And he said, okay, Dan, I'll hit you up soon. Next day I get a text from Dan. You're, you're basically saying you ready for this shit, you know? Yeah. And I, and, and I was like, let's do it. And from the beginning, we set out a plan. We want everything to feel like it belongs together. We want everything to feel authentic. We want it to feel unlike any, what anybody else is doing musically, even though it all is reminiscent of things, this is our thing. Common so, thread, a bond, a family. When you, it's a lot like Rick Rubin back in the day. He created this deaf American thing and then American records. And if it came, you knew it was going to be good. You knew the artwork was going to be good. You knew the music was going to be good. And you knew it was going to be fucking authentic, man. And that's what Dan started to build. You could see it. Totally. And, and he loves working in the studio and, the reason we work so well together, I think more than anything is that we have the same, the the drive. All we know how to do is work and create whatever version of art, whether it's me visually and him musically. And together we do the, we do the artwork really. Um, You know, he has, we, we work very well with each other on what the artwork is going to be and the feel of it because he knows the songs better than I do. And I know what the art needs for it. And so he brought me on and that started picking up. And, you know, the reason I met you is because I did the Marcus King El Dorado album and you were posting about it and talking about it. And I go, oh, my God, this guy is like a long lost, you know, relative of mine. Like we we just all around the board, just we. Oh, he likes T-shirts. Oh, he he likes the same music. Oh, he likes art. Oh, he, you know, it was like crazy to me because like you said, you look for that maid worn, you look for that, you know, uh, Wyco, you look for these people who, who get it in the same ways that you get it. 
and Metropolis. And, totally. And Dan and I f- have that connection that he, I know for a fact he's never had with anybody and I've never had exactly the same way that I do with him. And so, yeah, like recently, this ties it all back in is that you go back in time talking about what I'm drawing as a kid. I'm sitting there drawing the, the album art for Dookie by Green Day. Yeah. I'm, I'm studying every cartoon character. I'm trying to mimic it. I want to draw my own characters that look like this. I'm coloring it in. I have these little tiny notepads I'm drawing on because I need to draw all the time. And that's what I like. So I'm going to draw Green Day stuff. Dude, a month ago, I get an email. Hey, Green Day's putting out a new single. Do you want to do the artwork? And I mean, that was unreal. I'm getting emotional thinking about telling you about it right now because I and, and it hasn't really hit me like it does to give you this whole story, but that's unreal, dude. I mean, that's just yeah. I literally thought as a kid, I hope one day I I, I could do this for them. Right. Right. At the time, I thought I just had to draw the same thing that they already put out. I didn't know anything about it, but it's it's crazy to see that. I didn't seek out Green Day. Yeah. They found me and the fact that And a kid in Philly, man. Just a kid in Philly. That's what know? and I, I always I, I mean I really it, it's almost like funny to this point, but I'm specifically from Northeast Philly, which is just like I only use that as a point of pride because it's everybody moves to Philly and they move downtown, they move to West Philly, Fishtown. There's all these cool places. I'm from a place that like most people never have to go to. And yeah, I like that. Just, I like that about it. Bumfuck Egypt, Philly. <laughs> yeah, it's just it. it's just this other part, you know. And so I always say, like, just a kid from Northeast Philly, you know. I'm just yeah. literally, I'm just some schmuck, some kid who liked to draw and and was not good at school. Did you did you ever because around your art when you start to take art serious is when tattooing really starts to pop off with the big high dollar, you know, big money hourly, you know, two fifty an hour, 300 an hour tattooing and stuff. Did you ever try getting into that at all? Cause you're covered in tats like myself. I, I did actually. So e- even as a kid, I remember being on family vacations and I, I hate this. I hate the heat. I like, I like California because it's not humid. Right. But I always hated the heat. So we would go to Florida and my family would go down to the pool and I would be in the room practicing Sailor Jerry art when I was in high middle school, maybe. Yeah. You know, I was probably 13, 14 and I'm drawing like on my, I start, we go to, I make my parents drive me to Staples so I can get a high quality pen yeah and i'm i'm sitting in the hotel room or whatever drawing tattoos on myself i'm drawing the social distortion skeleton you know (laughs) i'm drawing stuff like that this man's ruin all these classic flash and um i thought that would be maybe be what i ended up doing and so i i got a tattoo machine when i was in my early 20s from a friend i tried it for a while i think honestly it was a cheap machine because i never I could never quite get it. I think I'd be better now if I tried, but I felt like ultimately because I'm someone who respects the craft so much right. as, as I know you do it, I kind of just decided, you know what, if this isn't clicking with me and I'm not doing it justice and I can't dedicate all my time to being a tattoo artist, I want to leave that to the professionals. And it's always in the back of my mind I like the idea of it, but I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy who thinks they can do anything. I'm okay with not being able to do everything. I get it. I get it. As a, as an artist, you know, I had um, to ask you because it's funny. Uh, cause my buddy Theo, uh, Theo Mandel, he, you know, he started as a great artist doing band flyers on hate street. Then he started painting all our leather jackets you know, Mm -hmm. with your band on the back, your logo and everything, he could do that. And now he has one of the most successful tattoo, Spider Murphy in uh, the Bay Area, one of the best tattoo shops going. So everybody, that was the road that a lot of great artists took because they're like, wait a minute, tattooing's hot. 
Uh, there was a lot of tattooing shows. Nico Hurtado comes around, starts doing these portraits that are blowing people's minds. Kat Von D's making millions. All of a sudden, people are like, wait a minute, let's get into the tattoo game. So I did want to ask you that because you are covered in tattoos. And I figured that might have been something that you tried at least, you know, a little I bit. Yeah. Yeah, you're totally right. And I loved I loved it in theory, but um, when you see people like you just named, I go, yeah, I don't need to do this. Yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. What am I gonna bring to the table that's better than all these other, I mean, not that it has to be better, but uh, I just love, I love it so much that it's nice to be on the outside of it. How many vintage t-shirts you think you got right now and how, uh, I mean, we know how you started collecting. You went up into the attic, got your dad's uh, born in the USA. And from there, you asked your dad to take you to thrift stores. Is that where you get a lot of the bulk of your collection or is it all over the last 20 years? So uh, it's it's all over the place. I mean, for me, a lot of people don't even do the thrift store thing anymore because they feel like they're too picked over. They don't put out any good stuff and whatever. Yeah. I still go to the thrift store that I first went to when I told my dad, can you take me to the thrift store? Because I still, dude, I found, this is my, my, my favorite thing I probably ever found at a thrift store because it is so specific to what I love. I'm a big stiff records fan. Like my, just to me, that's, that's the Barney bubbles did all the artwork. And he's my favorite, one of my favorite artist designers of all time, if not, you know, my, my biggest influence. Everything about it was DIY. It was like the first punk label, pretty much. So everything surrounding that, for the most part, to me, I feel so connected to because I feel like that's what I've done. What I've wanted to do is create this thing. And again, with Easy Eye, the label that I work for, it's similar where Stiff had a look, they had their slogans. They had their iconic logo and shirts, if it ain't stiff, you know, and I always loved that. And so I only say this because I was at a thrift store, this same thrift store that I always went to a couple years ago, and I'm looking through the shirts when everybody's saying, I don't find anything anymore at thrift stores. And I'm thinking when I was 12, I found that injustice for all shirt at the same thrift store for 50 cents. Wow. I know it was a long time ago. I have faith for whatever reason in this place. And I found the Ian Dury and the blockhead shirt. Wow. You know, the square logo, it says blockhead. It makes the face in the yep. box. Yeah. A couple years ago, I find it. It's on sale. It was a dollar. Oh. And, and this is the same thrift store I've been going to for 24 years or something. Wow. For me, there's nothing more exciting than going to these places and thinking I will either find nothing or maybe I'm going to find the next blockhead shirt or I'm going to find a Nick Lowe's or whatever it is. It's paying him for gold, man. It's paying him for gold. And that, and that's so much fun to turn your brain off with no expectations. You hope, but you don't know. So yeah, m uh, thrift stores, estate sales, yard sales, flea markets, eBay, literally anywhere that will have shirts. I'm 10 steps ahead of everybody else trying to figure out how to get them. And that's why I end up with these collections or why I brought them to show some to show you. Yeah, that's why I some. end up with the e Eddie and the monsters shirt, which is actually like Butch Patrick toured in a band. Wow. Really? And I met the lady who worked the show, her and her husband worked at the show and this is her shirt. That's and incredible. I, and I have this forever. And I grew up watching the monsters on Nick at night and yeah, and I love horror movies and like there's, there's just so many things about this that I connect with. And what else so, you got there? So I got this. Here's a R crumb, Mr. Natural. Oh my God. That's now, so good. Now this is still when he, it's an American greetings, uh, copyright. Wow. So he worked at American greetings in Cleveland. I've driven past the building on tour. It's, it, it, it was surreal to see it in person, but that's where Crumb worked. And so yeah. I don't know, this shirt might be late sixties or something, but is to Crumb me, still alive. Yes, he is. He's in France with his family and ah. he's, he's still doing it. He's still drawing and everything. Oh, I met Crumb a few times. Uh, that movie, uh, our Crumb is unreal. That documentary, it is unreal. Now what else you got there? So I have, a. 
I, I tried to bring very specific kind of rare, interesting shirts. Good, good. What's you know, that? Burt, Burt Reynolds? Reynolds. Burt Reynolds briefly owned a restaurant, oh. uh, kind of club maybe. Yeah. A Burt's Place. I, I want to say it lasted less than five years. And, um, you know, the other thing that, that I've told you before is the most I pay for a shirt yeah. is 40 bucks. And That's it has your rule. To, $40 is my rule. Yeah. And it has to be a crazy good shirt. Yeah. Now, two, uh, I could say I, I could count on one hand the times I've spent more than that. Maybe 50 bucks, maybe twice, 60 bucks, I think twice. And then I told you 1971 blood rock t-shirt. I, I paid $90 and that's the most I've ever paid. Yeah. And I've only seen, only seen pictures of it twice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I thought, I think it's okay. I could take advantage of this situation. This shirt being ninety dollars. Oh my god! Yeah, I'm the type of guy. If it was two fifty and I had to have it, I'm like, well, I don't eat, but I've got the greatest shirt. <laughs> right. And for me, I've just always known the challenge is to find the shirts that that I don't have to pay that much. So yeah. I could say, hey, I don't want all my friends to pay this much. I will literally find you the shirt for forty dollars and give it to you for free. Just to say, stop spending so much money on t-shirts. They're t-shirts. They're everywhere. Yeah. For me, it's not about having the most. It's not about spending the most money, which most people, I don't think it's about spending the most, but most people do. For me, it's about, I want to find the, the, the shirts that I get to tell you about it. Right. Even if, you, even if you know what it is, why, you know, you know this shirt. Oh my God. Look at that man devo all all over print when a lot of people weren't doing this because you had to make the fabric this wasn't like you were just screen printing it on you see it's sewn into the fabric no yeah. no no two of these are the same because they're, wow. they're positioned differently so oh man and what's funny is that that's an era of devo when they're pretty much like on the way down big time you know uh that's way, you know, I think that's 90s Devo right there. No, you know? this, this this is still 80s, but it, it's like this is like, this is like order of the back of the of the insert. You know, they would right. they would always have merchandise on their inserts. Of course. Th this is like probably probably mid to to late 80s. Yeah, yeah, maybe I would late say 80s. late 80s because there, I I know the record it's from, so I just don't know what year it's out. But man, that's cool as shit. And oh, do you buy shirts that don't fit you? Do you only buy them that fit you? Uh, if it's the right shirt and I feel like I'm going to hold on to this now until I get one that fits or yeah. I need, I want to have it just so I can say I have it because it's so special. Um, some of them I have that are just like that because in my opinion, it needs to be documented that it exists. It needs to be archived because these t-shirts are like, the way people treat books or records totally we, or you know we need to know for me they belong in a lot of them belong in a museum because they're part of pop culture they created by putting designs on shirts when that first started to pick up mostly with ed roth and the monster you know illustrator guys robert william you know all these people that changed everything because now we only know t-shirts to be the to norm totally it was underwear. It was just literally, it was, you wore it under your clothes. You weren't, if you wore it outside of your clothes, it was risque or something. Yeah. So yeah. to me, once you start putting things onto these t-shirts, that documents that this thing has lasted, even if it was for a week. If you started a band, made a shirt and broke up in the same month, that shirt tells that month long story. Yep. Yep. It's funny to think about that. And then, and, they're all pieces of art. I yeah. mean, if you see them in a museum up all on a wall, it's like that acid art show. The guy has all the acid in San Francisco, you know, the Mickey Mouse acid. And when they're all together, it makes one big Mickey Mouse and all that. It's 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 all art, man. And it's all art. And we're surrounded by it and people take it for granted and they don't realize without music and art, we would be walking through a silent, boring world. Yeah. It's wild. What else you got there? 
Totally. Wow. Yeah. No, I, first of all, I just, I, I, that it's such a beautifully put thing. This one I got on eBay yeah. for cheap, for cheap. 1982. This is Rajneesh Purim. Do you know, but this is like, there's a documentary about it called wild, wild country, but it's, they were considered a cult. Um, oh. and this, this was a shirt that was being Funding sold. the cult. Yeah, Rajneesh Purim, the first annual word, world celebration, and it still has the tag on it. You know, where I don't they, know if they where was this cult out gift of gift shop, and what was it? Was it like a like a Jim Jones type of thing where it was one guy and he was uh, starting a religion or something? That looks kind of like uh, it pretty looks much. Like, it looks like that cover for. Um, for the uh, George Harrison benefit concert. Oh my God. It, it, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it does. So, so there's like a whole documentary ab uh, about them. And again, it was one of those things where I watched the documentary and the first thing I thought of was merch. Where's the t-shirts? Yeah. Because people also, uh, rebel, uh, 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 protested them because they were, t they took over a town uh, I had to, I had to look it up because I just my the way my brain works I don't want to mess up the facts right but but um so they started this cult we'll call it and they took over a small town where there was already people living there in America so, yeah 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 and those people were were rebelling against this cult taking over so there were also shirts that were anti these people God, that's so. Cool. I always like to find the balance of both of those things. Yeah. And so I found these, which were not anti, they were, they were made probably by them. And, uh, I found this by accident, but for me, it's a, a matter of, I want this to go into the right hands, assuming that is me because people are learning about this thing now. And I go, well, now this is becoming even bigger history than it already was maybe just in that small town or where local news or wherever it was known. I just want this to be here so I know where it is. Yeah. Because yeah. this story is interesting and, and totally wild. What's, and the same, the, what's the documentary on? Uh, I want to say it's on Netflix. It's called Wild Wild Country. Oh. And it's super fascinating. It was really popular when it came out. And to me, it wasn't even one of the more interesting cults. Right. But it, it was interesting enough and a part of history enough that they made a documentary and it was a good documentary that I felt I want to, I need to just have something from it. Forget about it just to know that it it's documented because right. I, I want to archive everything, you know? Yeah. Um, this is an original Apollo 11 moon landing, 1969. Wow. That is I mean, sick. Look at that a, shirt. It's a kid's shirt. I paid $20 for it. It was never worn. Oh my God. God, that I mean, this is so good, dude. Look at that. Especially since, you know, the moon landing never happened. So they made merch for it. <laughs> 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 I was hiding my face behind yeah, the shirt. Yeah, 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 yeah. They even made, they even made that's, shirts for the fake moon landing. You that's, know? Why else is it a drawing and not a photograph? <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. You know, they, they were on a Hollywood back lot and they made the shirt shirts right there at the same time <laughs> this is a this is actually a kubrick shirt um, yeah it's a kubrick shirt exactly <laughs> but God this damn. is this is the stuff that I love what I t people always say to me they see it they, they saw a movie or they like a band or maybe it's obscure or rare and they say man i wish there was a shirt for that and i go no there is oh yeah if there oh. was a production they made crew shirts at least at least then there's promotional material. There's promotional T-shirts. Right. Even if it, even if there was a hundred made, I know this shirt exists. I I, it's over there. I meant to put it in my pile. But um, are you familiar with the movie Phantom of the Paradise, Brian De Palma movie? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yep. Is my one of my top two favorite movies. If I had to pick, whatever, it's up there for me. One of the most important movies uh, for me. I, I found it as a kid. And became completely obsessed. I have a tattoo of it. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, so I thought, I always saw these bootleg remakes people were making of the movie. And I thought, I'm going to find an original somehow. I, I, I just, I'm determined. I now own two of them. I paid $10 each on eBay. 
the original from the movie, 1974, I believe it was released. That movie is controversial because Kiss came out at the same time. Right. They started Swan Song Records. The movie was originally going to be calling the record label Swan Song. Kiss got mad because they were a band in the movie with makeup on before Kiss. I remember Kiss, that. I remember But that. it didn't come out till after Kiss was starting to be popular. Right. But it was made before. So this is setting this precedent of all this. Like Paul Williams, one of the greatest songwriters and voices of all time. Yep. In a Brian De Palma movie. I mean, everything about it blew my mind. And I was thinking, I need to get a shirt. And I found two of them. I tweeted at Paul Williams about it. He said something like, cast, crew, some promo, barely put them out. And I have two of them, my favorite movie of all time from 1974, whatever it is. Man. That's the kind of stuff that I want to show people even ex- just to, to let you know it exists. Because it, right. it always exists. And so it dream to open a museum? You know, it didn't occur to me till recently. I always thought like I'll do a couple books, I'll do some art shows, um, and just be the collector guy. But then I started to think, like you said, like I always think of something like the House of Cash or something. Johnny Cash had this yeah. building that was his museum. Right. And I I love the idea of having this modest sized room, basically just a big open room or a few rooms that are this room is all political t-shirts starting as far back as I can get. When was the first one made? Who knows? Whatever. Could have been some guy sitting at home. Like I have a Jerry Lewis sweatshirt that on the back, it's, I, sh- I think I showed you. Jerry Lewis, 7 p.m. on NBC, Tuesdays, whatever it is. Somebody made that at home. It's on the back of the sweatshirt in the 60s so they can walk down the street and advertise. Hilarious. You know, somebody- yeah, yeah. That's the stuff that I want people to know exists in a museum. I, uh, why is that not in an art museum or, or a pop culture museum, uh, media, all this stuff? Yeah, maybe Dan, maybe Dan would get into it. Dan's into cool shit, you know? Partner yeah, up we, with him. I send him t-shirts that he buys all the time. I go, dude, this is so up your alley, and he gets it. And it's like, you know, some guy in the 1960s was a sign painter, and he had a shirt that he hand-painted or whatever. That's, Dan loves that stuff. You know, I love, that's why we get along and why we make the art. This kind of ties it together. I realized this at some point, the reason we work so well together and the reason our art looks like this and sounds like this is because we are obsessed with these things. We want to be surrounded by, I mean, you could see, well, it's dark, but I have all these collections and stuff because that's what makes me feel comfortable. Why would I not want to create something? that I would want to collect myself. Like you said about Metallica once, uh, you know, or, or Iron Maiden wearing their own shirts. I want to be able to, to love it as much as I want or hope other people will. And if this is the stuff I like a bunch of old crap, you find at a flea market. Well, that's naturally how my things are going that I create are going to look. That's how the shirts I'm going to collect are going to feel to me. And it really is just a matter of being so in love with this stuff your whole life and it never changes. Yep. It's never changed for me. It's never changed for me either ever. ever. I know. And that's why I knew when I, when I started talking to you, I just go like, it's rare that you meet people who have, I've gone through phases, you know, I've had short hair, I've had long hair for whatever. But ultimately if you said, what's your favorite, you know, so-and-so B side or whatever it was about music or whether it's about art, it's always going to be the thing that blows my mind. The first time it blew my mind the same, the same way. My my favorite album cover is is the, you can't see it, but it's an Engelbert Humperdinck record literally. Cause I would see it at thrift stores all the time and the cover you've seen it, but it's his, I'm sure you've seen it, but it's his name. And it's so long that it, it starts to curve around and it goes down the side of the, the record <laughs> because his name is just too big. It couldn't fit comfortably on the front of the record, I assume. Yeah. And the, d- the designer thought this guy, this effing guy with his long name, it doesn't, I can't make it fit. I'll just make it go off the side. And it's a basic photo of him. It's not crazy, flashy, mind blowing artwork. It's so simple and, and, and funny, which again, comedy is the other thing that I obsess over. And that's hilarious to me. 
And and that's what I love. And I've always loved that album cover. And you could have asked me 20 years ago, what's the funniest or coolest album cover? I might have tried to be cool about it and said Injustice or something. Or, or, or even Back in Black is so... That to me is perfection. But when I see this Engelbert Humperdinck record, every time it influences me to just think a little bit differently, to to think that this has been funny to me and this record came out when, you know, 1967? I don't know when it came out. And um, that's what I love, the stuff that I've always loved and the stuff that you can progress as a person, you can progress as an artist, but you've no. connected to these things in your past because because they're relevant to you. And, and and when you meet somebody like you who gets it, I can't tell you how validating that feels to a person, you know? It's it's just amazing. I mean, I, I think it just has to do with just massive amounts of passion. Uh, you know, I think back to just stuff I love. Evil Knievel dolls, Bionic Man doll. Uh, promotional bendable uh, dolls from Jack in the Box called the Bendable Buddies, the, the Onion Ring Man, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. It's just in my soul. And that's it. it totally. It, it's just in there. It's just in there. And when you meet somebody else that has it, it's wild. You know, sometimes I'll sell a shirt on eBay, a rare one, and I'll meet the guy maybe in person. They come walking up. I go, ah, here comes me. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just know the guy's wearing the be- right glasses, the right boots, the uh, some jeans or whatever. You go, ah, this fucking guy, he's, he's cut from Dude, the same it, cloth. The best part about that guy is that, uh, uh, or that woman, in, in my case, uh, I've connected with a couple um, people in general who they could be any age. Yeah. I've met kids who are who are 12 that I, I talk to a, to school sometimes to students about art and I can meet a kid who's 12 and I just go, wow. I, and I'll tell the teacher, like, this kid is special. You need to pay attention to this kid because even if you know it, th- th- that soul thing that you talk about, it's inescapable. You can't you can't. Yeah help but notice it and some of these people i meet they might be in their 60s or their 70s they might have lived a completely different type of life that i did but you connect on this love of of these things that that brought you or you know for me when i buy collections off of people i know how much joy it brought and i want to know every story because for every story they have i have one that i could tell yep yeah and i never and i've never heard theirs and to me, the human connection and is more important than anything, especially lately, you know? Oh, God, yeah, for sure, man, for sure. Well, I can't thank you enough for doing the show. I can't thank, thank you. you enough for making one of the greatest shirts. I'm so fired up. They're going to be done next week. Uh, we'll be sending them out, and I can't wait to uh, see the dark Fonzie design yes yes i'm starting that next week finally because marin del rey uh, band dark fonzie band shirt and i hope to hang out with you one day in person and uh to spend some time with you and work with you on some projects because uh you get it and i i get excited when you get excited you know it's like we're like yeah 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 and uh, because it's our brains are already thinking of the things that each other are thinking about and 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 we it's like that thing everybody says like you can complete someone's sentences yep when there's when it's not even out loud that sentence which is how i i i feel like connect with you definitely how dan and i connect where he says hey can you try this and i go i was just about to send you that yeah. You didn't even know that I tried to make that orange or whatever, that that was the thing it needed. But because we have that connection, you know, I did want to leave you with one shirt, if that's oh, okay. Hell yeah. What this are you is, talking about? <laughs> this, this, I had the realization, maybe more than the Springsteen shirt is the most important shirt I've ever had. Yeah. Before I was born, my dad called in on a radio station, as you used to do. Absolutely. And they were giving Call away- 10. Caller 10 gets a pair of tickets. You would be like, I don't know how to tell what number caller I am, but I hope that I'm this very specific number. <laughs> I used to do it as a kid. And so my dad calls into the radio station, probably WMMR in Philadelphia. 
and he wins an Aussie shirt. Wow. Now my, my dad, you know, who doesn't love Aussie? My dad wasn't a huge fan, but of course he liked Aussie. He gets this shirt. There's pictures of me as a baby, literally a baby, drenched in this gigantic, solid black Aussie shirt, bark at the moon, bright colors. He's a werewolf. You know, he just looks crazy, scary, but I loved, I loved horror movies. Yeah. yeah. He's doing the pose. And so I, I have pictures of me as a baby wearing it. I get to elementary school. I probably wear it a little bit. It's huge on me. Middle school. I wear it. Some kid says to me, what do you know about Ozzy? You don't no. listen to Ozzy. And I, and, and I didn't know a ton. I knew the hits and I knew a couple songs from random things I had. And I told him, he goes, you don't listen to Ozzy. And he made me feel like totally not valid. Like I could, I could like it and put me off. I get to high school. Of course, I love Ozzy by then. And I wear, wear it then. Eventually I cut the sleeves off because I'm an idiot. Oh, Whatever. yeah. I, all my first shirts, the sleeves are gone, gone. What's the difference? You're still going to wear it at that point. Then you Walking realize around with the gun show. <laughs> then you realize like, oh, maybe I'm not that, that guy, you know? Yeah. So this shirt has been on every single tour I've probably ever been on as, as my night, you know, shirt to sleep in on tour. I've worn it just consistently for years. This used to be an Aussie shirt. Well, you could still see it on camera with the lighting. Yeah. Dude, there's paint on it. Wow. Look at the back. It, it was the hand scratching down the back. Wow, dude. That's so, so good. Wow. I want to gather all the photos, but there's a picture of me every decade of my life, pretty much. Uh, at least one photo of all the phases I went through. I always wore this Aussie shirt. Uh, look how great his logo is too. That they, I know. I mean, I, his logo. Whoever created that for the Blizzard of Oz and and carried on forever. Crushing logo. Crushing logo. So unique. And and how do you think of just putting little like lines in the middle of the what? What I is? It? I don't know. It is the one of the, yeah. It's one of the best logos. You're you're totally right. It's just oh, so great. God. Yes. It is a great great logo, man. Wow. And, and I've been wearing that shirt. I was born in '85. I think this this one is actually from '84. I believe because right. it's like two versions of this tour. Yeah, uh, shirt. I got the and, first version. Where is ah, He's like, yeah. you know, it's just kind of the cover. Yeah. And and I've had that. Yeah, I've had that my literally before I was, you know, my whole life. Yeah. So that that is probably my favorite, most important shirt. And I'll never, you know, somebody could could offer me ten thousand dollars for one of my dad's shirts. And I would tell them to go F off. Like yeah. there's yeah, there's yeah. just no way you you can't put a price uh, on it for me on t-shirts in general like for me it's about the connection that's why i give so many out for free yeah. to my friends that's why i sent you shirts because i said when i first started talking to you i go i need to just get this guy shirts that he'll care about because i have them and i rather give them to somebody else i have plenty of shirts yeah. it's not a it's not about having the most it's about getting them where they belong and if i belong with two thousand something shirts then i do but I might meet somebody tomorrow whose dad, I literally met a guy. Sorry, I promise I'll let you go after this. But yeah. I, I bought a collection off of my friend Cindy, who I told you worked for the Plasmatics, and her husband was oh, the yeah. sound guy. And I got a bunch of her shirts, and one was for this band called Cats. They were a local band, like South Jersey, maybe Philly. They were signed to Elektra. They put out a record. It didn't get pushed. I looked it up. I thought... The shirt is great. The album is pretty cool. New wavy kind of, I think produced by Rick Ocasek for some, you know, part of this, whatever. This guy who I play in band, play shows with in his band, amazing musician. He posts on Facebook, something about his dad, a picture of his dad who passed away, a song, maybe whatever I go, was your dad in that band cats? And he goes, yeah, I got the Electra band. So yeah, I go, Hey man, I have this shirt. And I don't know if you have any of these already or you've seen one or what. If if you want, I would be really love to send this to you. Yeah. And it kind of you could tell it kind of. What, you know. When it, when would you ever see that band's shirt? But my friends who worked at music venues, they saw that band play probably 50 times. It's amazing. And his mom is in there commenting. Wow, I can't believe this. You know, and I I sent it to him and I said, hey, man. 
this could have ended up being my favorite band. Yeah. Your dad, your dad, who's no longer with us. This was, and now you're a musician who is an amazing musician, living this, putting up, bringing this legacy, you know, continuously carrying us on. And for me to give somebody like that, that shirt. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. That's right. to me. That's like the, the, the I feel like I did a, a good, a mitzvah as we call it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing the grail. Yes. Great Thank guest. you for having me. It was amazing. It was amazing. I knew it'd be great. And I just love your story. And I love people to hear uh, about artists and how they get out there. And like I said, don't ever, uh, you know, don't ever underestimate how much we need art in this world, even if it's billboards, uh, believe totally. it or not, billboards, break it up for us. Uh, tell everybody where to get a hold of you on Instagram. Yeah. So at Perry shall shall like the word S H A L L. And, uh, it's probably that pretty much anywhere you could find me. Perry shall.com is the website. Get a you hold of you to do projects. Yeah. Hit me up. I mean, I'm always too busy and I always try to say no, but I can't. I, I, I love, I love, I stay up till two in the morning working. I love it. I'm so lucky, especially in times like this to be able to connect with people who like it and want me to have anything to do with them. That's great. You know, that's great. Well, one day we will have a Philly cheesesteak together. You, and me and Marcus. Yeah, Marcus both, King. But all the Marcuses we can fit in. Both Marcus Marin, Price and Marcus. Marcus Price. Mar 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 <laughs> Marcus Marin. Mar Marcus Marin. <laughs> Marcus Price is a beautiful If your name, name starts with Mark, we want yeah. you involved. <laughs> yeah. We'll all sit down and we'll fucking destroy some sandwiches and tell some jokes. Would love that. Looking thank forward to it. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Candles lit, my man. See ya.